So in previous updates, we've looked at how EVs are maybe, they're still growing in sales, they're still successful, but they're not growing as fast as they were. And a part of that is because a lot of experts feel that we've reached um, the initial adopter saturation point. So all the people that were initially really keen, the, the really tech savvy people, the early adopters, the people that like to get into new technology and that want to make a conscious or conscientious decision to move to uh, what are perceived as greener, more environmentally sound vehicles, EVs, have already made that move. And now we're looking at the rest of the market. And we're seeing across the breadth of the industry that a lot of manufacturers are like, I wouldn't say that they're pulling back quite so much, but they are certainly having cold feet and they're getting a little bit more hesitant. We've already covered previous reports about what manufacturers are doing. Um, just last month, Apple, uh, which was apparently has been working for like a decade on launching its own car, which of course was going to be an EV. Apparently, they, last month in February, it was revealed that they've shelved their plans. And uh, I was just reading a report now that... Um which took me by surprise because I remember attending an event by, um, by Genesis, which is a luxury arm of Hyundai, and them saying that that's it, we're going full EV, you know, the, the hybrids we've got at the moment are the last ones and the next generation cars are all going to be EV. Uh, apparently, it's, in, it's being reported by some media that um, there's some hesitation there as well, and it could be that they will actually be launching some more hybrids um, because they don't think the market is quite ready to go full EV. Um, but the most interesting thing that I saw was this brand new report about how, well, manufacturers are basically losing thousands. And this is the other thing, because a lot of people like, you know, I, often I see in the comments on the videos that I post and stuff like that, and people are like, oh yeah, well, the government is in cahoots with the car manufacturers. They're forcing us into EVs because the car manufacturers are going to benefit because they're going to sell us more cars, they're going to make more money. The reality is, and I've said this before in previous videos, I don't think that's the case. I think manufacturers are hurting big time because of this shift to EVs because they've had 130 years to focus on developing the internal combustion engine. And now you're suddenly asking them to pivot 180 degrees and move to electric. Um, and, you know, this requires a whole other level of R&D, of research and development, of assembly, of sourcing materials. It's completely different. And, um, you know, it also means that having to stop what you're doing, all of the infrastructure, all of the investment with what you've been doing, and then switch that to something new is costing a lot of money. And what's actually happening is that they're losing thousands, thousands on every EV that they sell. This is actually what's happening. They're hurting big time. Frankly, it's unsustainable. We, you know, it'd be interesting to see how far they can go. And this is why some of the newer manufacturers, newer startups are having a better run at it than the existing uh, traditional, or should we say legacy manufacturers are uh, in this instance. For example, like Tesla, completely devoted to EVs, doing so much better. BYD was always focused on hybrids and then EVs is doing so much better. It's actually now overtaken Tesla. Um, that's Chinese company. Tesla obviously is an American company. So and these guys are overtaking the existing manufacturers in the EV market and it, it's easy to see why, you know, because they are solely focused on that, whereas existing manufacturers are having to pivot. So what's actually happening? So there's a new report out from America by BCG. I thought I was BCG, brown car guy. No, this, <laughs> no, it's actually a Boston Consulting Group. BCG, yeah, exactly. Bolton, it says it's not, it's not me, it's BCG, Boston Consulting Group. And um, so they've been looking into this and some of their findings I've been finding absolutely fascinating. So I'm gonna go through that. I'm just gonna go, go through the report. Brown car guy. Sorry to interrupt the video guys, hope you're enjoying it. In the meantime, I wanted to tell you about this. It's my first novel, The Euless Files. It's all about cars, it's for you guys. Get your copy now at Amazon.com. They say that, well, the reality is that EV sales in America have grown. They've grown 50% in 2023, and that's good. And, you know, of course, obviously over there, like we have the ZEV mandate over here, where we are stipulating a minimum number of EVs sold every year, that percentage increases. The idea being to get to 80% by 2030 and then 100% by 2035. And similarly in America, uh, by the Biden administration is shooting for 60% uh, of all sales to be EV by 2032. Actually, so that is actually a lower um, uh, requirement that we have here in the UK and in Europe. But for America, that's still a pretty big deal. 
I don't remember this is the nation of uh, gas guzzling cars, you know, so um, so that's a big deal. Now, the fact is that, okay, they're saying that EV sales grew by 50% in 2023. The problem is that the industry had forecast a 70% growth. So this is why we've seen in America where, you know, we've, they've seen a stockpile of EVs. So the, 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 the narrative has been, the perception has been that uh, people aren't buying them. But when you look at the situation against a report like this, then what you realize is that they had over-anticipated the demand and probably led by, um, you know, the enthusiasm of the government and legislators in, in saying, oh yes, we've, we're convincing everybody to buy EVs and the manufacturers, okay, so we'll build more of them. But actually that didn't happen at the rate that they were thinking. And then again, we had the Tesla price war, Tesla slash prices in April last year, instigated a price war partly because of the fact that there was so much inventory lying around. And the fact that, you know, then that also had an impact on, obviously on all the electric car prices and of course on the used car market, which also went further depreciation, also used EVs already suffer quite a bit of depreciation. So the result of that was that actually manufacturers end up losing even more money because, you know, what little margin there was, even that's evaporated because they will have to discount heavily. So this has been a big problem. Now, what they're saying is that what's in store for EVs, particularly the next generation of vehicles, which according to this report, they're saying that they are expecting to hit the market between 12 to 18 months from now. I'm not quite sure what they mean by that because... You know, the car industry is in constant evolution. So mo models are being launched all the time and they're all getting better and better and better. Every single model is getting better and better. And as soon as they're able to develop and process the technology, the rate of technology and evolution and development in electric vehicles is probably the fastest I've ever seen it in the automotive industry. So, you know, they're not waiting around. As soon as they've discovered new stuff, it's coming straight into the vehicles. So it's, it's happening fairly rapidly. But anyway, let's go according to what they're saying. They're saying that there'll be a new generation of EVs hitting the market between 12 to 18 months. What's going to happen when they do? By our analysis, balanced regulation, broader vehicle segment coverage, and a lower total cost of ownership compared with gasoline-powered vehicles. This is an American report, so gasoline, but, you know, petrol-powered vehicles, fuel-powered vehicles. These support a scenario in which EV market share surpasses 40% by 2030. So they're saying that that's the ideal situation, that 40%. So they're talking, remember, Biden wants 60% by 2032. They're talking about 40% by 2032. Sorry, by 2030, they think that that is feasible. They surveyed about 3,000 consumers to understand what are the consumer demographics, uh, what are their barriers to EV adoption, um, you know, what are they thinking, et cetera, et cetera. This is what they found. In addition to the 6% that already own an EV, 38% of consumers surveys said that they do intend to purchase uh, an EV as their next vehicle and another 27% are considering buying one in the future. Now they're looking at how to convert the next wave of adopters into buyers. OEMs must address these key meridian requirements. 20 minute charging times. So that's the ideal. Apparently that's what um, the consumers want. They want 20 minute charging times. So not the 30 minute that all manufacturers usually quote. 30 minute detour and wait times for fast starting charging stations. So basically I, what I assume that to mean is that they want to be able to be able, get to a charging station within 30 minutes, you know, and then spend 20 minutes there. So you're talking about still 50 minutes to get your car topped up, but, and that should be a fast charging station. They want a range of 350. So apparently according to this 3000 consumers, what they found is that the ideal optimal range that they would accept is 350 mile range. I'm guessing they're talking about a real world range. Most EVs are actually, most of the latest generation EVs are offering 350 miles. But um, the next bit is interesting. What's the price? They're saying 50, this America, remember this is America, $50,000 they're talking about. So um, that's sort of what they're saying is the optimal price. Um, and they'll, uh, they'll also need to offer greater vehicle variety. So it's $50,000, £40,000 pretty much. Um, meeting these customer expectations is possible, the report says, but OEMs will require support from policymakers, the government, legislators, and the charging ecosystem particularly if they expect to make money. And there's the crux of it, right? If everything goes right, EV sales could account for up to 30% of US sales when the next generation EVs are in full production in the next few years. Again, I'm not quite sure what they mean about the next generation EVs, but anyway, they reckon in the next few years they could hit 30%. But then they immediately say a more realistic scenario is the market share will be closer to 20%. So the, the report immediately goes, oh, this could happen, but actually we think probably it's only going to be 20%. 
In either scenario, hybrids will play an important part. So, uh, you know, and this is interesting because Toyota, I mean, I just said before that Genesis is going, oh, I think we need more hybrids. And Toyota has gone down the route of hybrids and is still going down the route of hybrids. So, you know, Toyota <laughs> has known stuff for a while and they've, they've, they've been going in the right direction, plus their investment in hydrogen uh, fuel alternatives as well. Shout out time, guys. Thank you so much. Hey, if you enjoy my content, why not get involved? Buy me a coffee. You can do that at either of these links. Or if you're watching on YouTube, buy me a thanks or take out a membership. It all helps. It really does. Who are the next wave of adopters? Uh, so in many ways, the profile of the next wave of adopters resembles that of current EV owners. Most next wave buyers can install chargers at home and are more likely to have a secondary vehicle. Demographically, consumers in both groups tend to be more uh, tend to be men who are college-educated millennials with relatively high incomes. Additionally, they're less price-sensitive, more enthusiastic about technology, and more likely to indulge in a luxury purchase than the overall U.S. market. So to be honest, it's still that high end, really. It's still, we're still talking about that high end, that early adopters, people that can charge at home. And that's, of course, is the ideal scenario for most EV owners is if you can charge at home, especially here in the UK, because it's so much cheaper to charge at home than it is a public charger. So the, the, what they're talking about, the next generation, is still pretty similar to the early adopters. So where is the difference then? The next wave adopters place a higher priority on running costs and well-established vehicle brands than the current EV owners. So that, that, that makes sense. So the, the initial adopters just went, oh, look, there's a new EV, let's just buy it. You know, they didn't really care about what brand it was or where it was or who made it. They were just like, oh, it's new technology, let's just try it. And now the next generation are like, well, you know, yes, we want to do that, but we want to go with brands that we know and understand and trust. This is where the legacy manufacturers actually have somewhere where they can take advantage. But of course, in a sense, in the EV world, Tesla has now become, if you like, a sort of legacy manufacturer, hasn't it? Or, or no, I shouldn't say legacy, but it's say established manufacturer, a well-known brand that's associated with electric vehicles. And BYD is sort of closing in on that. So even then, I think the time scale or the margin of opportunity, window of opportunity, I should say, for legacy manufacturers is still quite small there. Um, Again, these early adopters, these sort of second generation new adopters, they also tend to be less interested in EV-centric features such as the front and ten tech forward, uh, tech forward infotainment. So they don't, they're not so fussed about the new tech. So this is where, when I see the latest gen of EVs, whereas the initial EVs that I reviewed a few years ago, they made a big deal of the fact that they were different, they were unusual, they had unusual features, and they had the one pedal mode and stuff like that. And sort of the latest versions you're seeing, they're actually more and more car-like, which in my mind is a little bit of a shame because I would like to see you know, the opportunity for uh, EVs, because they're so different, to really push the boundaries of design and technology and innovation and take us in new and exciting directions. But turns out consumers actually want more of the same. They want something that they're familiar with, comfortable with, that they're used to. So they want EVs that pretty much resemble and drive the same way that their conventional cars do. And I guess to an extent that does make sense. So are OEMs up to the challenge? Um, there's only one, according to the report, there's only one vehicle, this, and this is America, remember, the only one vehicle available today, the Hyundai Ioniq 6, that, was, uh, that went on sale in March 2023, meets the median consumer thresholds for price range, charge time uh, that was cited above. And the Tesla Model 3 is the second one on that list. So, wow, <laughs> Hyundai, well done. <laughs> it's funny that the Hyundai actually is right up there. They say they're doing really well. And that the luxury arm of Hyundai is like, mm, we're not so sure, interesting. The report also adds that the, according to their research, uh, OEMs do appear to be capable of technologically achieving several of those median thresholds that they talked about that consumers want um, for the next wave adopters. It is possible for them to do that for their next generation cars. The OEMs can make great strides sorry, in lowering charging times, extending range, and reducing costs. Progress is being made on high density cell chemistry. I won't go too much, but you know, lower cost e motors, 800 volt architecture, faster charging, et cetera, et cetera. We know that. We know that there's a whole load of new tech that's coming through the pipeline. There's tech that's such as solid state batteries. There's, tech, there's, there's stuff that batteries are using different components and different resources in them than we have currently. Um, so, you know, there's a whole load of opportunities that are coming down the pipeline in terms of technology. Um, and they'll probably come through pretty quickly because like I said, I mean, you know, with the EV development and evolution, they're not hanging around. They're actually pushing these events, uh, these technolo technological events through quite quickly. The only trouble is where does that leave the cars that we've already got? 
because what happens is they age much quicker then, you know, because then they're, they're becoming, you know, obsolete much faster than traditional cars would be because, you know, the, the car would be launched seven years on, the technology is pretty much the same, next generation comes out with a few tweaks. But here, within a couple of years, you're seeing a radical jump in range, in charging times, in efficiency, in performance compared to two years ago, and you're making those cars look much, much older, much, much quicker. So again, it doesn't really help for residual values. Hey, are you enjoying this video? Then make sure you hit the like button. It's very important. Plus, comment, share, and make sure you're subscribing. So now here's the big one. How much are manufacturers losing on uh, every EV that they sell? Well, according to this report, manufacturers lose about $6,000 on each EV that they sell around the $50,000 mark. Wow. So $50,000, we're talking about around a 40,000 pound car. At $6,000, it's just under 5,000 pounds, so say about 4,800 pounds. So on a 40,000 pound car, every manufacturer is losing 4,800 pounds on every car sold. I mean, that's, that's significant. I mean, you know, forget profit, forget small profit margins, you're hemorrhaging money here. That's what's actually happening. You know, this is crazy. So again, going back to report, we estimate that OEMs will only be able to close half of this cost gap by making the right technology choices. So again, you know, um, meeting those median requirements of, of the uh, next wave uh, adopters. Uh, economies of scale as automakers ramp up production will also help, of course, as they always do, but they won't make up the difference. Wow. Then there is the impact of the looming Chinese imports. So again, this is in the context of America. Market prices will contract further, exacerbating the profitability challenge. At some point, it will become untenable for OEMs to lose money on every vehicle they sell. What does that mean? Are they all going to shut up shop? Closing the cost to profitability gap will require help from elsewhere, whether through more aggressive efficiency programs, additional public support, or both. Policymakers could consider linking financial incentives to total range and range efficiency to incentivize OEMs to invest in the areas that matter most to customers. The charging ecosystem also have to find a way to smartly invest in making a network of 350 kilowatt chargers more readily available and reliable. Recognizing the demand for these chargers may eventually dissipate over the long term as vehicle range increases. So that's, so isn't that weird? That's kind of like, it's like a never ending vicious circle really, isn't it? It's like what they're saying is that you need a better infrastructure, charging infrastructure, not only more easily accessible and more easily usable, but these, you need these faster 350 kilowatt chargers so that you can, where, the, where some, not all cars are compatible to that by the way, but the latest gen, right? 350 kilowatt fast chargers where you could charge a car in 20 minutes but the demand for those 350 kilowatt chargers is now, and in the future, when the ranges much, get much, much bigger on these, uh, on these EVs, people might not actually want them anymore. So once you've actually got around to installing all those chargers, you get to a point where actually the, the market's like, yeah, we don't really need them now. <laughs> this is the problem with forcing a transition rather than allowing that transition to happen naturally. Because when it happens naturally, then you answer the problems as they happen, and then you all move together. But here, we're trying to basically put the cart before the horse. This is what we're trying to do, right? So going back to the report, they reckon that obviously consumers that want that higher range and fast charging um, should be prepared to pay a higher price. Those looking for inexpensive EVs would be more willing to accept a shorter range. So I guess that there is a little bit of trade-off, a little bit of consumer understanding is that if you want a cheaper EV, you're not going to get the range. And we're seeing that here, aren't we, with the Dacia, uh, was it spring something or other? Anyway, I'll, I'll put it in the caption. Um, the latest car that they're now launching. And um, that apparently is, is a 16,000 pound EV. We'll make it the cheapest electric car on sale in the UK. But the range isn't great. So, you know, that's, that's the trade-off, right? So going back to the whole concept of consumers willing to accept that compromise, um, BCG says, not this BCG, this BCG, Boston Consulting Group, our models indicate that up to 12% of car buyers can be reached with technology available today. Our optimistic forecast is up to 30% of US buyers can be reached with next generation offerings are fully in production in the next few years. That represents 
potential demand of about 4.5 million units, so 4.5 million cars. Of course, it's not clear if all these conditions can be met. Uh, if OEMs can improve profitability, they are likely to delay launches and may hold off on the investments needed to significantly improve vehicle performance. Uh, values over battery degradation, resale values could scare consumers away from purchasing EVs, or those same concerns over resale values could push them towards the used car market. Under the more conservative scenario, we estimate the demand to be closer to 20% or around 3 million vehicle units. So again, going back to the figures that they gave earlier and where they actually think, it'll, they, they think it could be as much as 30%, but it's more likely to be 20%. And they're saying that's because there's still so many concerns and there's so many myths and misconceptions and misunderstandings out there amongst consumers about EVs, some legitimate, some not legitimate. And, uh, and I think those, that, that's still having a massive effect. There is a massive reluctance. These EV sales, certainly here in Europe, the EV sales that we're seeing are mostly to fleets and companies, but not so much to individuals. Um, you know, and again, the individuals are looking at those high and early adopter type people and again that market's getting saturated and that's a problem now what they're saying here is that you could push people towards the used market so although people are concerned about the the, the fact that they lose value but what happens is that if fleets as, as it typically happens in the car market if fleets are the ones buying these vehicles new and then, the, then they get cycled into the used market. It's the corporates or the fleets that are taking the hit on depreciation, not so much the consumer. But the consumer then benefits, the private individual then benefits from buying that vehicle used because they're not having to pay the initial depreciation on it. And maybe that's the, that's the in for a lot of people to get into the EV, EV cars. Right, so in, to conclude this report, um, they're looking at, so when manufacturers are trying to win over customers with their next generation of EVs, um, I don't know why they keep going on about next generation of EVs, just EVs, I should say, simple as that. Uh, they will be going after a group that on average looks very similar to the current EV owners, but has more demanding expectations for price and performance. Meeting their needs will be challenging, but not impossible. OEMs will need to offer value propositions beyond environmental sustainability to compel consumer choice. So it's not enough to just people to say to people, you're buying an EV because you're saving the planet, but people are like, yeah, sure, the planet's important to us, but so is our pocket, you know, it's, it's, let's be absolutely honest, right? So is our need to get around, so is, so is the fact that the vehicle has to be feasible for our use and our purpose for which it is intended, right? This will require OEMs to develop a deep understanding of the specific needs of consumer, customer, uh, sorry, customer segments to differentiate their portfolios. OEMs will need to invest in the right technologies and product portfolios while at the same time aggressively tackling costs. I mean, how much more aggressively are going to tackle the cost to cut a loss, a deficit of $6,000, nearly 5,000 pounds on every vehicle sold? Wow. They will need stakeholders in the charging ecosystem to continue to invest in improving the charging experience. This is true. This is as true uh, in America. It's just, uh, just as true here in Europe and in the UK. To do all of this profitably, OEMs will have to rally pol policymakers for additional incentives. So this is where the subsidies that have been taken away, certainly here in the UK, and there weren't any announced in the last budget, are working against that whole idea of transition to EVs because, you know, there isn't any reason for people to do that in terms of financial incentive. Um, there is, for example, again, with company car drivers, there is the BIK benefit in kind incentive. So there is that thing that is actually driving some of those sales. Um, but even that diminishes over time. With 70% of US consumers stating that they would consider buying an EV, the market opportunity is there. But will OEM and their shareholders overcome profitability challenges and stay the course with required investments? Will policymakers and charging ecosystems step up the, to the plate? The answers to these questions will determine the pace of the EV transition. So that concludes that report. So there you go. I mean, I think that you know confirms what you know I've been saying for a while and what we are seeing in the market where manufacturers are really kind of are, are on shaky ground and they, they're feeling it because they're just not quite sure. I mean, they've been told by policymakers, legislators, governments to go full EV and they're like, okay, fine, let's, let's do that. Let's invest in it. Let's do it. That's what, that, that's what we've been told. And then on the other hand, the end user, the customer, the driver, the consumer is saying, nah, I'm not sure, sure. You know, and that's for a number of reasons as we've covered there. So this is the big challenge, how to get over those hurdles of A, 
tackling all those myths and misconceptions, but also getting people to want these vehicles. And I think it always goes back to the, my, I always say this, the same thing. It's like right car for the right person in the right situation. If the vehicle is ideal for that person's needs, they'll probably transition to it. Everybody wants a newer, nicer, more fancier vehicle, don't they? Everybody wants to go, oh, what's the latest thing? I want one of those, you know? It's like your, your phone, you know? You want to trade up to the next phone, even though like you're never going to use the new features that are on it, but you want it because it's the latest, right? So the same goes with the car uh, owner. Car owners aren't deliberately, you know, um, obstinately n refusing to go EV. They're just like, well, you know, does it work for me? You know, th th does it make financial sense for me? You know, and if it does, then they're probably like, yeah, all right, then oh, I'll give that a go. And like I said, you know, whenever I've reviewed a car, I mean, they're just getting better and better and better, and they really are very good vehicles. And if they meet your situation, ideally, if you can charge them at home currently in the UK, then you know they could well be the perfect vehicle for you to go for. The reality is that most people don't drive as much as they think they do on a daily basis, and they wouldn't need to charge their vehicle as often as they think they do. It's only those people that genuinely do long distances. And again, you know, we have to provide um, a segment in the market where we can't say everything must be EV. I think we'll always have to go, look, there's got to be a segment for people that actually do genuinely do long, uh, whether they are emergency services, whether they are, you know, uh, delivery services, whether they are long distance sales reps, you know, whether they are businessmen that need to get up and down the country and the train network isn't reliable, let's be honest, and expensive. Um, and we don't want people to fly. So therefore we want people to take the road. So again, you know, there are always going to be circumstances where maybe diesel and petrol are still the answer. So we, we've got a challenge and compromise between all of these offerings. But at the same time, this rush to force everybody to EVs, I think it's probably causing more problems than it's solving. Love to hear your comments. A brown car guy.